G'day, you're listening to the Big Breakdown Podcast with Chris Stafford and Harrison Marshall. Take it away, fellas. Hello and welcome along to Season 4 of the Big Breakdown Podcast. We're in this season we are looking at talent development and today we are looking at the Academy Programme. Uh, Harrison got a great uh, guest uh, to kick off our series on uh, the next part of the series of, of sort of what the talent development pathway can look like. Yeah, I think we um, we set the series up quite nicely um, amongst those kind of first first five episodes, really, of um, of actually you know looking at what are the kind of the key aspects of a talent de- uh, talent development pathway and, uh, and breaking those down a little bit. And now we're coming into like these next couple of episodes, few episodes where we can really delve into what some of these academy programs are actually doing at their academy uh, in their academy pathway so um i think yeah so it'd be a it'd be a good one today to sort of to get a good to get a good understanding and really to build on to the next couple of other conversations that we've got coming up so yeah look i'm i'm, I'm really looking forward to this one today and i'm sure it'll be a i'm sure it'll be a cracker yeah, no. So today we are joined by Ian Costello, Academy Manager at Munster. Uh, from 2011 to 2016, Ian was part of the Munster Rugby's coaching setup, working initially as a skills coach and then as assistant coach with responsibility for defence and kicking. Ian worked with her academy in under 20s and was head coach of the Munster A side that lifted the British and Irish Cup title in 2011. In 2018, Ian joined Wasps as defence coach before rejoining Munster in 2021 as Academy Manager. Ian joins us today to chat about the Academy pathway at Munster. Ian, how are you? Great. Thanks a million, lads, for, for the invite. No, thanks for, for agreeing to come on. It'd be, it'd be really interesting to sort of learn about what goes on um, over there in Munster and, and sort of the environment that you're working in. I think sort of just to, to kick us off, you just give us maybe like a, a brief overview of sort of the academy structure that, that, that you've got over there and, and sort of what that looks like. Yeah, and I'll try to put into context maybe kind of having been reasonably familiar with the English one as well. Um, so, you know, we don't have a senior or a junior academy like they do in England. We just have uh, a contracted level. So an academy player, we have a three-year cycle. Um, no specific age, like it could be 18, it could be 19 that you could come in. I would say it's a little bit older than England, generally. Um, and it would be year one, year two, year three, if they need the three years. But, for example, last year, two players progressed into senior contracts after year two. Um, and a year one player would have signed a senior contract um, but would view to staying in the academy for an extra year. So that's the structure of contracted level. You can have up to 20 players. Um, we have 14 at the moment, um, but I suppose the RFU budgets or allocation is around 20, but you'd always try to have a focus on quality. Um, and then below that, we have, it's changed names many times um, over the last few years. Before I left, it was called a sub-academy. Now it's called a, a national talent squad, NTS. And that's coordinated into the IRFU where there are, I suppose, a minimum service requirements or minimum service provision from every part of your of your team. Um, and then we line up something beside that where it's the PTS, which is a provincial talent squad. So essentially casting the net a little bit wider. Um, so 14 academy players, um, 14 to 16 NTS players. And the PTS then really depends. It's like our players of interest. So anybody involved in national squads, even late developers. So that's the top end of our academy. We, that's probably the only terminology we'd use around academy. But we're, we're using pathway an awful lot more. And we'd have a 19th, 18th, 17th team that are competing in the Interpro Series at the moment. And then underneath that, we'd have quite a wide group of under 16s in particular. So from kind of 16s up, will be where our elite pathway kicks in. I think, I think it's something here as well, the, 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 word, the word pathway sort of being used more because of the, the early stages of people starting to sort of come through from, from sort of 14s up. How, how do you sort of allow, what is the, like, the connection or the alignment then between sort of all the, the different stages all the way up to that, that, that sort of contract phase? Yeah, I think there wouldn't be, I'd say the word that we talk about are the, uh, the part of talent development that we talk the most about would be alignment and coherence. So um, there's been a massive focus. I've only been in the job, um, I think this is my 15th month, but Munster is a very complex landscape in that there's clubs, schools, very geographically spread out. There's uh, very, I suppose, long-standing 
historical and, and political considerations as well. Uh, and, and we've worked very, very hard on, on that alignment and coherence with external stakeholders. But the, I suppose the vertical coherence or the vertical alignment between the senior team, the academy, and then the pathway, as we call it, that's what we've probably worked the hardest on in the last 12 months. Um, so we've worked on our technical alignment. So what are we coaching? Um, our coaching practices, our coaching behaviours. We use a phrase like bandwidth all the time. So we don't want everyone to coach the same way, but we want there to be a very coherent bandwidth so that a player moving through our pathway is layering on um, his development and experiences. But yet, um, I suppose, having enough different coaches with different styles to add to that experience. So that's arguably priority number one. And, and I probably don't go away from the quality of coaching as the most important thing. Every time I drift away from that, I come back to it. And I keep saying, yes, the quality of coaching is the key thing. So that's the, I suppose, the big picture stuff. And then how people would progress. Like anything, we have a very wide base at 16. And we have four regional squads. Uh, we move into um, uh, maybe a two-tiered system under 17, where we'd have clubs and schools. And again, Munster is set up, so there's very distinct pathways for club players, for schools players. That progresses into 18s, into competition phase, where right now, um, this weekend, for example, we're in the middle of an 18s clubs and 18 schools interpro. And then we merge into one team under 19. And we used to have an under 20, 20 um, competition. That's gone now because we feel that you should have enough information by 19. And then we pick the better players to compete in development and A games, which actually run straight after the Interpro Series. So the Interpro Series will be three games. We run into a development and A structure for three games after that. And probably at the end of that, we're talking then about talent selection. So... Um, who makes it into our NTS, who makes it into our academy, who's on our depth chart. Um, so yeah, fun time of year for for all that um, around the development and then obviously getting the selection right as well. So, uh, so do you get a lot of, so is the province kind of yours as a club to run? Um, and then how much influence do you get from the governing body? So I know with the RFU over here, they're very much, you know, they they give a lot of structure to the to the fourteen uh, premier premier academies across across the country, and that kind of dictates the direction and the path that they go. That they've all got their own individual kind of tweaks. But then, how much how much does the um, national government body have on have an impact on on the way that you have dictate your pathway? Yeah, I think that's look that's a real strength of the Irish system. Um, it's it's governed centrally. Um, like I'm an IRFU employee, even though I work for Munster. So something as simple as that. All the elite player development officers are all um, funded by or are yeah all funded by um, the IRFU. Um, it means we we share knowledge. You know, again, we've a lot of coherence and share practice right across the groups. Um, so huge amount of support. I report directly into a, a, a Peter. Peter Smith, who's the elite player development manager, and um, you know, massive support from the IRFU in general. But what they also uh, are very comfortable with is a degree of flexibility because it's all about your context, isn't it? It's all about your landscape. So, for example, one of the provinces would have two schools that feed the majority of their or a very significant majority of their professional players. We don't have um our environment isn't similar to that. So we have a number of A schools and we have a number of very important clubs. So our connections and relationship with them is vital. Um, and it's so spread out, our, our talent development environment, I suppose, is then we have to get our, um, there's a lot of pressure on our talent ID, a lot of pressure on our selection, and then really how good our processes and systems are when they come into us. Because we don't have, uh, we have very good relationships with schools and clubs, and it's it's even this week we had a, a massive open day with engagement and that it's ever improving. But at the end of the day, we can only really control what's happening in our environment. So we spend an awful lot of time um, and effort, I suppose, in getting the right people in, plenty of opportunities to come in and out so that we're not restricting um, anybody at an early age. But we put a lot of pressure on us and our processes, systems and getting the right people in. That, that's what we we did. We uh, we spoke to, um, to to Don Barrell about the, the the England rugby pathway, and he sort of spoke about that sort of over here, especially where you can sort of dip in and out. I mean, that kind of touches on something that you spoke about earlier with the, the the talent selection bit. So, what what sort of that 
what is it you guys look like in terms because I assume that it's different at each age stage of sort of the expectations of what it is to get in at one phase to then sort of progress onto the other what are your and uh, key performance indicators maybe are what, what is it you look for in sort of the these players as they're coming through that score system so there is that alignment because like so if you've got a number of different stakeholders then that, it's important for that process especially to be aligned so that you're getting the the right sort well say the right sort of the players coming through the the meet a, a certain level what, what is it the coach are looking for yeah that's the hardest piece like um because anybody who tells you if a player is this and this he'll make it it's it's you know you challenge that big time there is no one identifiable fact one ident identifiable factor you know you look at speaking to all the most experienced coaches out there, looking at all the research and literature that's out there, there is no magic bullet. There's so many different factors. It is as complex an environment as, as you, as you can possibly come across. So I think the key, the key is, is you keep it as broad as possible for as long as possible, you know, as many people for as long as possible, many eyes, many times. So you've got a lot of things feeding into your system, uh, people that you trust, um, people that are aligned, uh, around what good looks like um you know shared mental models is massive like if the three of us looked at the same bit of footage we'll see three different things but the more time we spend together talking about it um looking for i suppose clues around what's been successful what's worked in the past we have a better chance of of having that common picture having that common common understanding but it's a massive challenge because we have so many coaches at different stages in the pathway so for example practically we had 12 alignment meetings this year around designing our curriculum. So we had all our staff come together 12 times for two hours. And every single time you had to come with work done. And there was a lot of stuff sent out in between. So yeah, they were, yes, they were the targeted pieces, but an awful lot of look, social learning, I suppose, community to practice stuff that's out there using WhatsApp as simple as that. And then getting together formally um, every three weeks approximately. And then the real test for that was we went into a residential camp here in the University of Limerick for three weeks and we all worked together. So we, we had a number of my role within that after we have the alignment piece is probably quality control. So what we're doing, I suppose, is organically or naturally trying to share learning, share understanding of what good looks like. Lots of little conversations. Yes, we want to formalize it. So we have a clear idea of, you know, what our cornerstones are, what our core skills are. We've standard templates for evaluating players but i know and we all know from experience we'll all evaluate differently you know even two people that have been in the game for 10 years will still evaluate and score a player differently on different criteria so i suppose it's trying to have as much alignment as often as possible um and then the top end the talent selection again it's just based on so many things it's based on obviously physical technical tactical psychosocial lifestyle and then opportunity you know what opportunity is there at the club in the province what does the depth chart look like who's the head coach what attributes are they do they consider the most important so i know that's a long answer it's because it's a very very complex space and it's what we're looking at at the moment we're looking at specifically that question how do we select at different stages on our pathway that's literally a research project that we're looking at at the moment. So hopefully six months down the line, I might have 5% more clarity on that. Yeah, I, I, being being in, a, in a talent development system myself, I, you know, we, those alignment meetings are, you know, I think are, are so important in terms of trying to break down that, that complexity. But then it, like you say, it's also important to have the different views because you know, everyone's got their, everyone brings their own expertise to the table. Mm -hmm. um, with it being so complex, what, what what would be so if I'm a if I'm a parent or I'm a player that's within the system, and they're not quite they're not quite understanding why they've not made it to the next step or you know their best friend has, but but there's there's different complexities at, at play there. What's what's good, your kind of process in terms of engaging with you know maybe it's a club coach or a school um, as well as the parents players about uh, about educating them within the complex process. Yeah, I think I, I, everything comes back probably to relationships and communication. And, and we went hard after our relationships with the clubs and then internally between the senior team, the academy and the domestic game, which is our pathway, uh, our domestic game, sorry, but when you combine it with the academy, that's our pathway. 
So my connections with the head of rugby development, with the coach development manager are critical. And that's been one of the key relationships for me because it gives us the best chance of aligning all our staff and spending time together naturally and developing relationships where we trust each other that were, I suppose, it's as natural a process, as organic a process as possible. Yes, of course, we have to formalize it at various stages, but finding that socially, that learning, that understanding, that trust in each other, and the more time we spend together um, watching and talking about rugby really gives us the best chance of of, of being successful, whatever that looks like. Um, the second piece is we do have strong protocols around how we communicate. So if somebody has been deselected, you know, even HR are involved in that, as you'd imagine, we have very tight protocols on that, what the expectation is. We make people aware of, we make sure that we meet those expectations and people are aware of those. So if you come into this program, you will be notified on this day, you will have feedback on this particular date. And then we challenge ourselves internally pre-competition, during competition and after competition to provide feedback on players so that it isn't just reactive to games. Um, so once we finish that development, sorry, what we called our, uh, our, resident, our development phase, which was a three week residential model, you know, we put a quite a substantial investment in that this year. Um, we all, every, every coaching group with each team um, had to do a very brief um, feedback process or review process on each player. We'll do that again mid-competition and we'll do that at the end of the competition just for consistency. So when we are having conversations with players, I suppose there's real clarity around what they expect of them, um, you know, what they need to work on and also what their what their strengths are. Yeah, well, that's probably a very, very smart way of doing it. It just breaks down that, that you, you've got to try and remove that ambiguity because ambiguity can 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 well, can ruin a program if you have a player not if you're not clear with players or you're not clear with the, the alignment with the coaches then that's where it can that can where it can fall fall down on its feet yeah um, absolutely and I think and I think as well like Harrison on that there's practical elements to that like if we have 120 in for a trial and you're you're selecting 60 and you've been over three weeks you've got to let 60 people know there's so many mixed opinions on the best way to do that you know if it's easier at at, at you know, the stage I'm at, if we're selecting somebody, you know, you're sitting down, you're having a 30 minute or a one hour meeting with him and his family. It's very straightforward, not easy because you're delivering good news and bad news. But there's a very manageable process around that because of maybe how far they've progressed along your pathway. And then we have a clear process around um, why they were or were not selected. And we, we communicate that really clearly. What's more difficult is, is down the pathway, isn't it? It's where you're going from six, 120 to 60, you're going from 60 to 40, 40 to 30. And then what do you do with the other 10 that don't get selected? How do you have enough eyes on people enough times that have just not made a 16 squad or 17 squad or 18 squad? Um, like, for example, we have a player making his debut tonight against Gloucester and he wasn't in our system three years ago. He's 18 years old. He's, he, he's going to make, and look, touch wood, um, you know, he's well prepared for that. And he wasn't in our system three years ago um, or within our formal elite system. And if we didn't have a net outside of that, potentially he was missed. Well, not potentially, he would have been missed. And there's stories like that all over, though, isn't there? I mean, like, I was chatting to, um, to to a mate of mine in Adam who was a, was a teacher, um, and he got a lad um, that came to his school that was, um, he said, around 100 kgs, but he could... Um, slam dunk in the in the sports hall but it was he could he could play a little bit of rugby as well so he's he's just been picked up and gone down to um to London Irish as part of sort of their their sort of academy system and there are these lads that will just appear out of nowhere that might not necessarily have been on anyone's radar because of the nature of I suppose how how we develop you you're going to pick people up into the program that that little bit later because of physical development and and other things alongside it so there's no that's why I suppose it's important to have them different entry and exit points, isn't it? And we shouldn't just get stuck at, at one level. We've got to give everyone that opportunity to to move up into that, that op to get that opportunity, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, what we're very fortunate here is is there's a quality team in place. You know, we have an academy team and then all the way down the pathway. And, you know, specifically, there's talent coaches, there's elite player development officers, there's pathway development. We've 
structure ourselves. You asked a question about the IRFU and alignment. We've structured ourselves in a way that we think works best for the province here, for our environment, for our context. And really fortunate whether it's our SNC staff or you know our mental skills, uh, our rugby coaches. We we've put together a quality team and we keep coming back to kind of three things. It's it, it's people, processes and systems. So we want to have the best people that we possibly can have. If they move on, have we got the best process and system in place that somebody else can come in and and pick up where they left off? And that applies massively as well to deselection and late development. Um, and it's it's all like, let's say, take a talent coach that's based in the other half of the province. It's the six, eight, ten people that he has in his network that feed information into him that might be the most valuable part of his job. So it's yes, you've got we've a, we've a team. Um, of 17 staff, but how does that extend and how do we spread out with the connections that we have and relationships that we have all around the province? So, you know, we're not missing potentially talented players. So, sort of, sort of with that then, I mean, you've, you've touched on some important points there around sort of the, the mental skills as well and the, the, the psychosocial development stuff. What, what sort of principles are in place sort of there on the ground from when they they gain into the program is the is the support there below 16s that you offer is it, it more so when they they get at 16 if they are what what is it that we're sort of trying to encourage the players to sort of um develop mental skills wise yeah we um it's quite topical actually because we were looking at our curriculum this morning um we probably kick in at nts level and just again you asked about structure we've nts three two and one and basically that means um where they are three being the youngest two years out of two years to go in school nts2 was one year to go in school and then nts1 is their first year out of school sometimes we don't bring them straight into the academy well sorry more often than not they go nts1 um not straight into the academy but there's always exceptions the, there's a formal program in place around mental skills at each of those stages and it, it's layered in and today we were just looking at okay uh, and this is the challenge in the space. Yes, we've got a three-year ac academy program, but how often are guys actually getting to three years? So we decided to scale back our curriculum to two years. Um, and then the kind of outcome of that meeting was, well, actually now the NTS becomes even more important because they need to have a good foundation there around um, psychological skills. So what we looked at today was ranking prior, or sorry, putting a list together of priorities on an individual and a collective basis so that we have a pretty clear curriculum and if that if our you know we've a really good psychologist that works at our senior team as well if he moves on there's a curriculum in place to just pick up where he left off um, which i think in some cases isn't always the case You're very reliant on the person so we looked at everything from you know goal setting visualization um coping skills um uh, self-regulation resilience um like across a huge spectrum and they all you know coping strategies we looked at uh, receiving and giving feedback uh, positive self-talk um, and I think he actually said if if there was one thing that was the most important self-belief was probably the I thought it was a great way to start he said self-belief or optimism either way that would be the place he would start with every single player and I thought it was nicely you know I kind of that's your North Star, I suppose, and everything has flowed from that. So we were literally in the process of saying, okay, how much should we do collectively and how much needs to be done on an individual basis? And the tricky thing about the mental skills space is you've got the well-being side of it, which is always urgent and important. And then you've got the performance side, which is always important, but maybe not as urgent sometimes. And we're trying to get the balance right between setting our players up for success and, and a really simple way, you know, um, uh, Anya McNamara, uh, a specialist in talent development, she talks about uh, PCDs, which are the kind of psychological characteristics of developing ex excellence. We, we we look at that as a model and we look at it's like a deck of cards that you can deploy at any time when you need them. So we're trying to equip the players with this deck of cards. So when they need self-regulation, they can play that card. When they need discipline, they need self-belief, they need self-talk again. They have those cards to play and a big part of that then is us getting the balance right with the amount of challenge that they have along the way that it isn't a smooth sea it isn't a snow plow clearing everything out of their way that we you know we provide enough challenge plenty of support but enough challenge where they have to use those skills and i think the real cha challenge wrong word i think the really good environments get a good balance between that challenge and support they have those psychological skills they test them 
um, or they teach them, they test them, and then they tweak them again afterwards. And it's the learning piece afterwards that's vital. So we're trying at the moment, we're, we're literally looking at how we can improve that space. And again, like everything, uh, it isn't always straightforward because time is your time is your biggest enemy. So have you so have you have you tried that before then trying to almost, you know, de deliberately manipulate parts of the session in which they're almost almost set up to fail because but you know the <clears throat> talent development is never a, a linear, it's never a linear process. There's going to be bumps along the way. So have you have you have you have you tried it before within the session to actually increase the challenge that they might actually struggle? Yeah, I think that there's a concept, I suppose, a pretty strong, well-developed concept about periodizing challenge as well. So it's not just about the challenge within a session. We do that. We do that quite a lot. We challenge people around selection, non-selection, um, coming off a bench, um, being, you know, maybe potentially pulled from sessions or pulled from periods of training. Um, sometimes there's enough challenge there already. So, you know, you might have. Uh, Harrison, plenty of challenge in your life that we don't need to add to. Chris might be having a nice and cushy, so we decide, look, we'll 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 drop in a few, um, I suppose, design a few little speed bumps along the way and make sure that we support the player around that. We could be miles better in that space, if I'm honest. Um, you know, like anything, I feel that we under resource at times the the psychological services that we can provide. Um, we're trying to expand the provision that we can do in that space. But yeah, definitely looking um, at how we can manage the challenge and and probably periodize a little bit for when players need it to kick on. Um, I, I suppose that is the hardest bit, doesn't it? Because if I mean, one of the key themes from every episode we've pretty much covered on the on the podcast through all the different seasons is um, that that understanding who understanding your players, mm -hmm. and I suppose the 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 one of the main challenges for any talent development pathway is the, the potential number of players that come through for the average for, for, for one coach or four coaches if you've got a big group to get to know everyone in that group that is a challenge in itself especially to cover some of these key things and I think that's why it's maybe an area that that is sometimes forgotten about and why I think it's it's hard for the the grassroots club coach especially to to really fully understand how important these elements are to developing these players not just as rugby players but as people as well because a lot of these things are a lot of life skills as well as making them better rugby players to, to deal with them challenges. Yeah, I think there's a few pieces that jump, a few parts that jump to mind. You're 100% right. So look, I, I think it's tricky. I, I, I'll try to remember my train of thought here. There's three or four things that jumped out there. One was that the player has to be the centre of everything. And I think that, I think for me, players have been pulled a lot in different directions. They're playing with Irish squads. They're playing with, you know, uh, senior training, senior games, club commitments, S and C, etc. So you have to have a north star for your decision making. So I make it very easy. I, I just keep the player always as the most important thing. Keep the player at the center, and I just explain to everyone that will always be the basis on which I'll make decisions. You may agree or disagree, but I'm comfortable. That's my north star. So keeping the player at the center of that. There's a few things we talk about all the time. Care and competence is one. So we say, and, and me as a coach. I firmly believe care and competence is, is vital. And what I mean by that is players need to know you care about them. They need to know you're genuinely interested. And I think at every level, grassroots in particular, no, actually, sorry, that, that's not fair. At every level, getting to know the player, um, whether it's walking you know, to the pitch with somebody, walking back from the pitch, having a cup of coffee, sitting down, having lunch, chatting them in a session, whatever it might be, um, I think players respond my experience tells me the players respond really well to knowing that you care about them. But the second piece of that at this level, at the high performing level and elite level is they also need to know you can get them where you need to get them or you can get them to where they want to go. And that's the competence piece. So I think it's making sure you have the knowledge and coaching craft and coaching practice and, and, and a well-formed, um, uh, I suppose, a well-formed coaching process that they know, yes, you care about them, but you can also get them to where they need to get to. And that probably brings me to kind of the third thing. We're kind of operating at that tough love, you know, the challenge and support type model. And it doesn't suit everybody. But for me, it just resonates that there's nothing wrong with, you know, showing you genuine love and you really care for a player. Um, but there's times there needs to be tough love as well. We're doing this because it's the best thing for you. 
we you, you've lost the right to train because you were two minutes late. You're not prepared for this session, so we're sending you home. You're not being selected now because you didn't do A, B, and C that we agreed, but we're going to support you to get there. We're going to put everything around you to make sure you're the best opportunity of being successful. So again, we're trying to, back to the alignment and coherence piece, we're, we're trying to operate off a little bit of a shared model around what those things look like. Um, and as a team, we're a year down the line and we've, we're reasonably, we've progressed nicely along those things with tons of work to do. I think there's, um, I think there's uh, some really interesting points you raised there. And actually it reminds me as um, I've listened to another pod, um, I think it's a high performance podcast and they got um, uh, Sean Wayne on from England Rugby League. And he talked around you know, the tough love element, right? He wants to create a, uh, almost a family environment uh, in a high performance area, but is actually being open and honest with the players and actually showing your competencies, you know, and, and saying right, that we need to see these steps or you will have to be released at some point. And actually he said, it was, it was quite interesting what he said around um, when the players, the players knew when they were going to be released because he was so open and honest with them about performances and how they were getting on that he didn't, he can't, we can't shy away from those conversations. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Um, I think same with, you know, we're, we're going through a kind of an annual performance review with, with staff as well at the moment. And I kind of feel like there should be no surprise when you sit down with and have a formal review. I think the same with players. When you sit down and have a selection or a deselection meeting, you should have had strong enough uh, touch points and contact points along the way that you have... Um, good processes and systems around one-on-one -on -one reviews, very clear on what the expectation is, what good looks like, what good enough looks like, um, very clear in terms of their individual performance plan, their development plans, their playing plans. And that takes a lot of time. And, and, and I suppose what it does is, again, a, a piece that I heard that resonated with me is you've got to be prepared to have lots of tough little conversations so you don't have a really tough one down the line. Um, are a really critical one. So it's just making sure I think that nobody gets caught by surprise and that communication and uh, peace is really strong and that your processes and systems facilitate that happening for every player so nobody falls between the cracks. Uh, and that's what I find hard, if I'm honest. I, I, you know, my last 11 years up to this year was was coaching professionally and it was far, this is a very strange comment, but it was far less complex. Um, it's obviously high pressure. It's week in, week out. But this environment is far more complex and because there's so many plates spinning. So what I find is if you don't, you know, as soon as you turn away from one plate, um, you know, the, the attention or focus goes off of it. So we put an awful lot of stock on the account we keep, the records we keep and how we manage and monitor things as well. And that's where I'm lucky that there's just a pretty incredible team um, has been put together over the last while. No. Uh Go on, Go on. I, I just, yeah, it's yeah, that's it's, it's quite interesting that it's. I think there's a common misconception. I think it goes back to a, a conversation we had in uh, in season two around coaching domains. Um, they a lot of people see that the natural pathway for, a, especially a coach's pathway, is to go via academy and then step into first team. But then actually, like, they're two completely different environments. You know, I think, and I've you know, I've, I've been quite fortunate. I've gone in and and watched some of the. Uh, the what first team coaches operate and it's you have to you have to have a complete different just mindset to how you deal with academy players from the age of 16 to, to 21 than what you can do with with first first year senior players and i think that's you know the, the spinning of the plates and dealing with the the stakeholders is is, is the big one is the big one for that um what would so what would what would your advice be for like so the, those coaches who are work at the club and they've got players who are obviously talented and are involved in your in your pathway, um, but like I said, that a player is struggling and has not quite made it or been deselected for one week. Um, how can that coach then support the player? Because actually, he's probably not going to have one on technical and tactical level, is he? Because you, you're probably you probably guys at, at Munster are offering that, but is that way is that way he's got to step up psychologically and um, and support that way? Yeah, I think, look, there's, again, a lot, an awful lot of, of conversation around what's performance coaching, what's development coaching. And I think what's becoming very clear is now it, there's there's a huge amount of grey. You know, I, I don't think it's, I think in theory, 
there's a line between them. I think in practice, and, and that was something that we were chatting about off air earlier around a little case study that we looked at and we found that the development players performed and the performance players developed. So where does it start and where does it end? Like it's 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 not clear. There isn't an age, there isn't a stage model that you suddenly go from development to performance. And I think the same in coaching. Um, there are some challenges because I think in terms of profile, in terms of, you know, how people are financially rewarded, um, obviously at elite level and performance level, it's far, it's far more significant. And, and without giving away um, who I was talking to, but somebody at an English soccer academy or football academy, sorry, over the, sea, over the water, a football academy said that um, they had a number of staff at academy level that were paid the same band as you know a senior coach and that was to keep the best people in that development space so what is challenging in the development space is is keeping the best staff because an awful lot of people rightly so see it as a progression to, to senior rugby um or senior say working with a senior team it hadn't traditionally been the case in ireland it wasn't a natural pathway like it is in england there's a very natural pathway from academy to senior um it's becoming more normal in Ireland. I'm not too sure why, maybe it's the quality of academy staff. And what we're looking for, I suppose, is people to really commit to two, three years in that space. So I think, um, I suppose that's maybe just setting the scene around the challenges. And then your specific question is, you know, around supporting people in, in different environments. We try to support people like holistically, like it, it's, it's everything. It, it is sometimes an arm around them. Sometimes it's, it's, um, preparing them for you know what comes next sometimes it's motivation sometimes it is technical tactical sometimes it's something that's lacking physically so i just think it's individual and what we're trying to do i suppose again as a as a development team is we're trying to make sure we look across we we look holistically across all the players development so if he is dropped if he is selected if he is not selected if he has an injury hopefully we've some of the tools he's already been equipped with some of the tools to, to deal with that and from a on-field sort of thing, then, Ian, is there a we've, we've touched on sort of the word curriculum sort of quite a lot as well. Is there stuff that goes out to support coaches with the idea of sort of what what players around decision making, around skill level? Is there stuff that, that coaches are aware of that of how they can support players on field in their environments to sort of make sure that they're developing on field properly as well as sort of off field? Um, is this stuff that you guys sort of look for within that? Is there some set um, coach education stuff that you advise for coaches to make sure that whether they're fun things we've we spoke about sort of a lot is that yes, there's there's players coming in and out of the pathway um, all the time, but it's making sure that they do learn generally better. So if I'm a club coach and I've got my club players, not all of them will get into the Munster system, but the lads that are playing will still go and play. The best level of rugby that they can when they get to the end of that age group. So, is there is there stuff that you support coaches with from a, a coach head perspective on developing players on field? Um, what does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. And again, pretty timely because, as I, I kind of mentioned earlier, we 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 had a an open day for coach for clubs and schools on Tuesday. So we brought them into our high performance center here. Um, we tried to create an experience around um, previewing the session. So they came into our auditorium. We previewed what was going to happen that day. We did an overview of what's happened the previous few weeks in 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 preseason. So I suppose lift the hood and let them look in and say, complete transparency. This is our attack. This is our defense. This is the way we've trained. This is why we've done it. So this is where we've come from. This is where we are today. You're going to come out and see a session in a few minutes and give them all. Obviously, you know, uh, give them the session plan give them a clear outline of what it involves and, and, and what the intention behind it was, because it's very easy to look at something. If you don't know the intention, uh, it's it's arguably a waste of time. They came and watched the session and they met the senior coaches, a QA and a at the back end of that. And then we closed the loop today, actually, where we'll send out a review of that session. So we kind of brought all of what would be our leading clubs and leading schools coaches in to experience what that whole process looked like. So that's the most recent one. Probably more long term, what we've done is our domestic game department, again, run excellent coach education supported by the IRFU, very, very active in that department. And then we've launched what we kind of a cornerstones program, we call it. it. It existed previously and prior to my time, they've done a, a really, really good job of putting together a document around that. What we've done now is try to evolve that and bring it to life. So as of again, Tuesday, 
we, we, we pretty much launching this around the province on our four cornerstones, which is our, our carry, uh, our catch pass, our tackle and our breakdown both sides. We have different layers, technical document supported by best practice clips, supported by activities, along with the PDFs of what they look like. And finally, a voiceover. So four different levels for those four skills. And the last two we added were attack and defense decision making, which are incredibly difficult to put down on paper. So what we talked about was what would we want coaches to coach? So if we were moving on our pathway, what are the key things? Is it really a 2v1, 3v1, hard defense, soft defense? There's so many different elements to decision making. We stripped it back to habits and some key messages. And the habits were invest. So work early, invest early scan and communicate so is every player coming on through a pathway in position quickly with his work ethic um is he scanning so is he looking up and taking pictures what's in front of him and then is he telling somebody about it they were the three habits okay there's nuances to that but essentially they're the bullet points and then the two questions we challenge coaches on all the time is do our players know where to look and they know what to look for and that's based on some stuff from doug lamoff and it's quite simple really because top performers know what to look for and what to disregard. So we just said, can we get those three habits around decision making and can we challenge our coaches and players to educate around those two points? So that was the kind of what behind it. And what we do now with that package is all our staff were involved in developing that over those 12 alignment meetings. And it literally took a year. It took a year to get it right. And this is version one. We'll evolve that. And every few months, we'll evolve that based on what the senior team are doing, et cetera, what we think is transferable to the pathway. And then we'll update that to all our stakeholders. And then the, the bit that I'm hoping works, and we literally are at the start, the genesis part of this is, let's say you want it uh, at Was Harrison, um, or an amateur club, probably better. You would contact us, we'd come to you, and you'd have a cup of coffee with us. And we'd explain what the Cornerstones package is. We'd take you through the whole lot, and then we literally hand it to you. But now we're in the door and we're offering you a resource. We're offering you a service. We've built that connection. And also we've given you the background of it rather than just a resource. So we launched that Tuesday and it was pretty well received. And we'll start rolling that out now in the next week or two. So I suppose summarizing it all, very well connected top to bottom at the moment with the senior coaches. They'll do a series of four workshops during the year. Our domestic department from a gener generic coaching point of view are, are, are exceptional. And now we're going to roll out this cornerstones to all our stakeholders. And hopefully that gives us, um, you know, the rising tide, all boats, et cetera. Hopefully we're helping improve individuals and environments around the province. Yeah, that's, um, well, that, that, yeah, that sounds brilliant. And, it, and it's a very similar process to, um, to, to what we're doing at WASP with, um, <coughs> well, with Mike Ashford. He's, he's come in and we're trying to align the, the pillars of, from under 14s DPP all the way up to up to uh, senior academy, um, but it's yeah it, you as you probably alluded to that it's a it can be a long and, and an arduous an arduous task but you know hopefully that the, the benefit there is is the rewards is the rewards coming out um, come out of it in the in the long term. Um, so in terms of so in terms of layering on some you know technical detail, I guess you probably. Uh, you keep it quite generic and then make it more specific. Is that, that's probably a yes. similar process what we have over here in terms of specific positional skills and things. Yeah, I think I went slightly away from the passport idea of at 14s, at 15s, at 16s. Again, what we tried to do was, or maybe how I see my job is interpreting what the seniors do and what they, that's what the game of the future looks like for our players. And then what's transferable to the pathway. And this is where the bandwidth comes in. We upskill together and then we have good conversations around what we think is suitable at each level. So rather than trying to formalize that piece, because my, I don't know, again, maybe you have a better system than WASP, but I find that that breaks down and it kind of doesn't really live. So we're going to try to have a lot more contact as coaches to keep discussing those on a social basis and a community of practice basis. And then at several stages throughout the summer, like every Tuesday throughout the summer, all coaches coached PSS or positional specific skills together. So in every single session, the 19s coaches led supported by the 18s. The 17s might lead the next one supported by the 18s. So we coached together a huge amount. And that was the, 
Um, these are just ideas that we had at the end of the, the year alignment so that we're learning off each other all the time. We're establishing common practice, but we actually haven't really formally had to write it out on paper because my experience is that kind of dies off. Um, but we have to keep quality controlling it. That's the key. We have to keep quality controlling our practices and we have to have very good coach development and coach support um, processes around it. So, so, how, so what does that look like? Because I know that right at, the, right at the start of our conversation today, you said your number one priority is, is quality of coaching. Mm-hmm. So I guess similar to the, uh, within your role, similar to how we do it with players, is that part of your role is to do that with coaches as well in terms of making sure that they're constantly staying on top of them themselves, upskilling them, as well as yeah. giving them opportunities to work with the under-19s and under-18s coaches? Yeah, absolutely. And and again, there's a couple of really good people in our pathway. You know, we have a coach and player development manager who's excellent in that space, um, the head of rugby development. Um, and I think they do an awful lot of the hard work and, and the broad work. And, and where I try maybe add value is that quality control piece around the coaching. Um, and it's probably more specific to my background, you know, um, coaching, I suppose, a while at this stage and coming back into the space where where I feel I can add a little bit of value having maybe had a lot of different experiences and probably invested a bit of time in the last couple of years in, in, in trying to improve that side of, uh, of, um, of my portfolio, I suppose, or of, of the experience that I have is, is, is really looking at what good practice looks like for our, our context. Um, we have some excellent coaches on the pathway and a case, it was maybe a case of all of us pulling in the same direction. So it wasn't a case of me or Keith or Colm or anybody else saying, this is what we're going to do. It was a case of sitting down and saying, okay, what does good look like? What does best principles? And we've kind of gone away from best practice. We, we, we're using a phrase best principles because again, it's, it's, it's much more process related and we can control our processes and we can really decide what our principles are. So I just find that when people are involved in that process and they're invested in it, I think it's far more likely to be lived. And I've just seen too many things before where it hasn't come to life and it hasn't had any sustainability. We've gone this approach. We're only a year in as a group. Um, and the first real test is probably now around our interprovincial series. But we do things like review every week. So like, you know, last uh, a couple of months ago, we'd review midweek every team that had played. So we share learnings from each other. Um, and it might be something that helps you with your team, helps me with my team. And it's really back. And I know I'm saying the same thing again. It's just back to it's back to trying to have a shared model. It's back to social learning. It's back to us all being one community of of coaches. And I probably maybe just facilitate that. Well, that it's something that me, me and Harrison spoke about before, actually, around how even if you're in the community game and you've coached from like let's just take the, the England model where under nines where tackles brought in and then you move up to, to under tens. How many times has the previous under tens coach come down and sort of helped you to talk about the challenges that they might have had over the season? What did they learn from that? Because the chances are you're gonna have the same probable challenges that, that they've had. And I think that that shared um I think the, the, the great word you use is community practices is that we're we are helping each other even within club that we're we're sharing examples of you know some of the challenges that we have because we're, we're you're never going to see the perfect model while while you're coaching there's going to be challenges especially over a long season how did we get over them the chance are the next group's going to have them we need to support everyone because that's then going to make that coach's experience better as well as for the players um i think that that sharing is really really important um i'm just sort of cautious of the timing because i know you need to get on the road for for sort of the game tonight um just, just sort of, sort of. Finally, if you for for the for the grassroots coach that is listening, what what would be sort of your your key advice for them while they're operating within that talent development pathway? Because you know they, they are the, the starting block for a lot of them. What advice would you give to them um, to 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 make sure that they're giving the the best experiences to to their players? Well, actually, that was, uh, just a second though. I was thinking about a word that I hadn't used, and you just you just touched on it there. It's it's providing it's experience, and it's it's just creating the best experience um, for players so they want to come back and play more and they want to perform at the highest level if that's the way they go. So I think at grassroots level, it's it's around creating an environment um, that people, that players really enjoy, where they have a really positive experience. And positive experience can take many forms, I suppose. It's 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 the quality of training, it's how much fun is that training, it's it's how safe they feel at training, it's how how motivated they are because they're getting better and improving all the time. 
feeling connected to something, feeling that they're part of something, you know, that's maybe bigger than them, et cetera. There's so many life skills as well as rugby skills that I think all add to that experience. And if I'm honest, um, I, I would I would focus on on, on all, all those things. Um, I think as a coach, it all depends on your time. Um, and I think, you know, I'm always trying to develop my knowledge, um, you know, across everything. And sometimes the more you learn, the more you realize there is to learn. And I think it's just if you're really invested in it, it's keep talking to the right people, keep making sure you're getting your hands on the right material, um, taking your time to plan really well. Um, I think that's massive in terms of the experience. Take time to reflect, whether it's in the car on the way home, whether it's, you know, 10 minutes after a session, whatever it might be. I think they're the things that make you better as a coach. I think the players will see that, the players will feel that. And I think that all adds to the experience. Um, and probably the last thing is, is nobody knows your team and your players uh, like you do. So once you've taken the time, which is massive to get to know your players, you will know your context better than everybody else. So don't necessarily try to find solutions that work with other teams or other players. You'll know best what works with with your own players. Um, so I think context is critical. But your word for me, if it was one word, experience, the best experience for players that you can possibly, um, I suppose, provide for them. I think that's a, a great way to finish. Ian, it's been absolutely fascinating chatting to you. I mean, I've made, I say this after every interview, I've made loads and loads of notes here of sort of, of, of some of the, I think there's loads here that, that Connors will be, be able to take away. So thank you very much for, for giving up your time and, and coming on to chat. No problem. Thanks, me and lads. Pleasure. Take care. Harris had a great, uh, great guest there with Ian. It was quite nice to um, sort of put all the, the previous episodes together and find out sort of how that works within a, an actual academy environment yeah no i thought it was um i thought it was a cracking a cracking episode with uh, a cracking chat with uh, um with ian i think it really gave some insight and really brought to life some of the some of the key topics that we've mentioned and we've spoken around uh, so far in the season um and actually like uh, hearing you know kind of their selection process uh, at munster in terms of who progresses is was quite good to hear that they do take into account the psychosocial tech tech um, understanding and, and their physical attributes I mean, what was I think what what was quite interesting within that is that last point you made around um, kind of you know it's it also comes down to opportunities as well. You know, sometimes it's you know, for the players who are going to make it. It has the kind of it's it's quite brutal to say sometimes, but the stars have to align, and actually the opportunities opportunities have to be there. Whether it's you know potential injuries to the first team or uh, the head coach has a certain style of play, or maybe even a depth chart that they need to get these certain players in. So. Um, you know, it, it can be brutal, but I think what was really key within that is that, you know, the psychosocial, the tech tech and the physical, all the elements we kind of spoke around earlier on in the season were all, were all key factors that, that, they, that they took into account um, when, you know, when thinking of the pathway. Yeah, I mean, like, <clears throat> it's, I like the bit that he said, so it's as broad as as long as possible, but then more eyes gives you more opportunities to sort of see players. And one of the key things that that that, that I like was that there, was, there should be no surprises when they actually sit down to review. So like they're constantly in their program giving the players feedback, which kind of um, just to let them know that where they're at. So when they get to that point, that they're aware of sort of where they're at, and that it's sort of, that's helping them sort of that transition through if they are not going to make it. They've kind of got a better idea of where they might go before it gets to having that conversation, which probably actually might make some conversations a lot easier. Well, it's just no surprises. You know, I think whenever you're in a talent development pathway, it's the players should know where they're kind of where they're where they're at and and why they're there and um, what the opportunities or what they need to work on to be able to create these opportunities. And if they're if it's just, if there's the same things being brought up on each individual individual development plan meeting um then they actually they should already begin to get a bit of a feeling that this isn't going to be their long-term future with it within that within that environment now that might be get, being dropped from that environment it might be the kick up the ass the 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 spark to the firecracker that sends that goes no nah, nah, i am going to go to another environment and prove that they're wrong but you know it was interesting to to hear that like you know Lots of small conversations are better than having one big bad conversation. Yeah, and it kind of it touches on <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that we spoke about with Andy, but then also sort of that, that 
uh, the stuff we spoke about with Dan back in season two around, you know, self-awareness is like, <clears throat> because they're, they're, they're sort of looking at the individual and that collective, bit, they're, they're looking at that, that goal setting, you know, use of visualisation, knowing sort of where they sit within the team, building that, you know, that words that's used a lot around resilience and stuff as well, around how they're giving that feedback and how they use that and, and being able to cope with the setback and, you know, I think that's something that, you know, I need to touch on that bit of the best feedback is the feedback that's asked for. But like, like we've alluded to, you've got to be confident enough to go and ask for that feedback as well. And you've got to be, that, that comes from the environment that you create, but then understanding yourself to be able to be confident enough to go and ask for that. And it's, I suppose that self-belief, that optimism is that drive that's going to get you to where you need to be. And if you tick all these other boxes, you're not only just going to become a better rugby player, but like Andy said, with sport being that social setting, you're developing so many other skills that are going to see you better later on in your life. One hundred percent. That's where sport can be. You know, can be a real driver. Um, a, a, a real driver for that. And you know, it's... you've got to be able to. You've got to enjoy it. The players need to be there to enjoy it. And that, and I think that's key. When sometimes when we look at that talent development, it's like, oh, well, we've just got to drive. We've got to get these players to be better. They still have to enjoy that experience. They still have to enjoy being there. Because that's then going to drive and dictate how successful or how much effort they're going to put in to actually be that better player. But then there's also going to be an appreciation that sometimes it's not going to be enjoyable. Because, you know, not everything about rugby union is is enjoyable. Um, and it's important that this is where kind of we as coaches kind of come in and we can frame it to be more enjoyable than what it is to get to get the best outcomes but you know, it, for them to be able to be successful there's going to be some there's going to be some, you need to work bloody hard sometimes and actually that's where uh, we, it's important that you put challenges uh, challenges in there but make sure that there's um, the right you know, psychological systems in place that if they do fail the challenge that we can we're there to pick up the pick, pick up the pieces um, you know, that, and that's where it's really important but I think what's, what's other, what else is really um, what's really impressive um with the pathway that, they, uh, that Ian's got up um, in Munster is just around the just around the amount of work they do to a, to the alignment. You know, just around you know the, the, the last year they had every 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 three weeks they met for a, a, an alignment meeting. That was all the coaches within the pathway, and they'd sit there for two hours and they'd always have to come with work. You know, that's like that, that, that's massive, and that, and this is probably where you know. It, it's actually trying to get those clubs within the within the province within the region involved. So therefore, you know, they're able to you know, they're able to understand what's what's going on within the pathway. But then also, right? How can they also help with those psychological setbacks or with those setbacks in terms of right? Go away, work on these tech tech skills. Now they know what's going on in the pathway because of these alignment meetings. You know, that means that you can bring the clubs in closer, bring the schools in closer. So therefore, they have a greater understanding of what they can be doing to help. Yeah, no, no, you, I agree, and that, and that's quite that, that is massively something that um, you know. I know I appreciate that the majority of the coaches that will be listening to this, being the volunteer base, you know, to, to meet every week, sort of to try and do that planning is, is probably you know some of them might be um, one quite daunted and two quite a lot more effort. But actually, having that alignment within your group and knowing <clears throat> sort of knowing where you need to be, so start with the end in mind, like we've spoken about a lot through in the previous series, <clears throat> and build to that point. <clears throat> sorry, is really, really important. And actually, um, if we can get that right, not only are we giving a better experience for the players, but through having more of an alignment, working better as a coaching group and as a, as a club to a degree, because clubs can take some ownership on that as well. Players will enjoy more coaches and enjoy more, more people stay in the game. And if more people stay in the game, that 1% will make it to the top. But actually, we're just creating more and more of a base, base of players that will play at every other level, that will keep the game ticking over and they'll be better in the long run. Definitely, uh, they, they, yeah. They, they, yeah. Well, that's, it's, it's a bit of hard work, and but that hard work, you know, it, it pays off in the long run. And actually, you know, like you said, within that, they began within that process. They began trying to find the cornerstones of what Munster Rugby is all about and how that feeds down within the pathway. Um, so we talk around some of the technical and tactical stuff on the on the field. Like, you know, I think they talk around you know three habits. You know, can the other uh, players going to invest in in working hard off the ball? Then can they scan, and then can they communicate that? 
So that's the three habits that, that they're looking for, which they are, are identified that make elite rugby players. Now that's also, you know, yeah, important that you know we do that at all levels of the game. And then in terms of helping the coaches, it's you know, are we asking the players where they're looking and what they're looking for? You know, so that it, it, you know, you're then beginning to break down those those, those key communication and, and, and scanning and scanning skills. But what I think was really good within this whole alignment is that it is top top to bottom, bottom to top as well. It's you know, four sessions a year. You're getting senior coaches to come in and 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 help with the sessions down below to to really reinforce that there is a pathway there, and people can kick on and, and, and can kick and can kick in. And actually, Munster is is a big part of the province, and this is where they want everyone to buy into that culture that Munster is trying to create. Yeah, you call that, but <clears throat> communities are practiced in me and that, that bandwidth of everyone working together and, and getting them where they needed to be. <clears throat> no, it's good. Really good episode. Um, so we'll be back uh, next week. Is it next week or are we having a week off? I can't remember. It we is are next back week. Next week, week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we are, are back, back next week. week. Sorry? We are back next week, yes. Yeah. See, good job. You've got, you know the schedule better than me, mate. Um, so we'll be back next week with another academy manager. Um, it's a really good listen. Um, if you uh, follow us on social media, Charlie's got all our details at the end. And we'll see you next time. Cheers for listening. Don't forget to join in the discussion at Big Breakdown HQ on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram.